What's up, folks? Welcome back to Tactical Tortoise. My name is Trevi, and if you've been watching my channel recently, you probably know that basically the entire core rules for Warhammer 40 Gay were recently spoiled. So what we're going to be doing today is going through the stratagem section of those rules and breaking down in depth each one of the core stratagems of Warhammer 40k, the rules surrounding them, when you can use them, some tips and tricks for getting the most out of them, so you can improve your games once the edition fully releases. I have a full video breaking down all of the rules if you want to go check that out, and if you want to join my Warhammer 40k 10th edition content and tutorials and things like that, please drop a subscribe on the channel, like on the video, all that YouTube stuff, and let's dive right in. First, we'll talk a little bit about what exactly a stratagem is. Stratagems are special abilities that you can use throughout your games, and using them costs you a resource called command points. In the 10th edition of the game, each player will gain one command point at the start of each player turn, so you'll have usually about 12 to play with over the course of a game. However, some units will give you the opportunity to gain more command points as the game progresses, or let you use stratagems for free. So, constructing your army in a way that uses command points the most efficiently is going to be an important part of list building. In 10th edition, stratagems themselves are broken down into a couple different categories. These are battle tactics, epic deeds, strategic ploys, and war gear stratagems. The different categories don't actually mean anything, but they will interact with rules within your army differently. There are some characters, for example, who will give you discounts or improve the effect of specific types of stratagems, like a war gear stratagem or a strategic ploy. The new format for stratagems is pretty easy to read as well. When you look at the stratagem card, you'll notice that they are color coordinated. The color corresponds to the time during the game that you can use the stratagem. Stratagem in green are usable on either player's turn essentially any time, stratagems in blue are used during your turn, and stratagems in red are used during your opponent's turn. The rules for using stratagems are also broken down in the when category of the stratagem. Each category will tell you the specific timing that you can use it, for example, when a unit is selected to shoot, when a unit is selected as the target of an attack, something like that. They will then tell you the target that you can choose to use the stratagem on, the effect of the stratagem, and then any restrictions imposed on the targeting of the stratagem, such as the ability to only use it once per game, or restrictions on the effect, such as attacks made during Overwatch only hit on sixes. You'll also see on the left side of the stratagem a CP counter. This is the number of command points that you deduct from your total when you use the stratagem, and you'll see some timing icons. These correspond to the phase of the game in which the stratagem is used. The little check mark with the circle around it is a used at any time stratagem. These can come into effect in a variety of different situations and phases, so they don't have a particular phase that they're used in. The star or iron halo is the command phase. The upwards pointing arrow is the movement phase. The reticule is the shooting phase. The two upward pointing chevrons is the charge phase, and the two crossed hammers is the fight phase. Again, the specific timing of the stratagem is going to be laid out in the when section of the stratagem, but the color and the phase icon of the stratagem is useful for just keeping track of which stratagems you should be aware of at a specific time. So if you're looking at all your stratagems at one time and it's your opponent's fight phase, all you have to look for is the red crossed hammer stratagems, and then you'll know exactly what you can do during that phase. Stratagems can only be used once per phase, and you'll get access to the core stratagems that we're going to be talking about in this video and then also six stratagems from whatever detachment you've selected when constructing your army. Those are not yet fully revealed, so we'll be talking about them in the future once we know what all the stratagems in the various detachments in the game will look like. So that's all the background information out of the way. Let's dive in to these strats. The first one and the most important one is Command Reroll. It's used immediately after you have made a hit roll, wound roll, damage roll, saving throw, advance roll, charge roll, desperate escape test, hazardous test, or have rolled the dice to determine the number of attacks made with a weapon. The effect of the stratagem is simple. You simply re-roll whatever that roll was. Now, there's a little bit of nuance to this one that doesn't come across immediately. The first thing being that rolls that include multiple dice, for example, a charge roll or a weapon that fires 2d6 attacks, when you re-roll that roll, you re-roll both of the dice. You don't pick a single die to re-roll. This is not the case for attack rolls, however, like hit rolls or wound rolls, because 
in the attack sequence of the game, each attack technically progresses one at a time. So while using the fast dice rolling rules that are explained in the rule book, you can roll a bunch of attacks together and you'll roll all your hit rolls and then all your wound rolls. The rules consider those to be happening one per dice roll at a time. So you'll rolling 20 attacks, you'd roll 20 individual hit rolls, and immediately after those hit rolls, roll 20 wound rolls. Rerolling a hit roll or a wound roll only affects a single attack, not all of the dice in that entire attack sequence. Now, another little idiosyncrasy with this rolling is that in the fast dice attack sequence, so when you're rolling all of your hit rolls and all of your wound rolls together, as described in the rulebook, there is a little bit of ambiguity whether or not you will re-roll things like saving throws or damage rolls after seeing the results of the other saving throws. The rules tell you to only roll them in a batch if the order in which they would be assigned doesn't matter. Having knowledge of how many saving throws or how much damage you're going to be receiving does actually change your decision of whether or not you would reroll. We we'll probably have to wait until the full rulebook comes out and maybe we get some FAQs to elucidate us on exactly how rerolls are meant to be applied to fast dice rolling. But until we know more, I would ask your opponent about command point rerolling when you're going through the fast dice attack sequence. Otherwise, saving command points for particularly important dice rolls, especially things like advance rolls and charge rolls to ensure that your units get to where they need to is an important part of Warhammer 40K. And oftentimes if you have multiple charges that you need to make in a turn in order to conduct your game plan, you'll most likely be saving one or more command points to ensure that you make those charges. It is important to note that while you can target different roles with this stratagem, you can still use the stratagem only once per phase. So you can't reroll multiple charge rolls in the same phase, and you can't reroll multiple hit rolls or, and or multiple wound rolls in the same uh, shooting or fight phase. 10th edition has added some important additional options to reroll, however, especially within desperate escape and hazardous tests. Desperate escape tests are tested after after you fall back with a unit that is either battle shocked or entirely surrounded by enemies. This allows you to move over enemy models when you're falling back, but does force that desperate escape check. If you have a particularly important unit like a vehicle or expensive character who would die as a result of that desperate escape roll, then saving a command point reroll to save them is pretty important. And so the same goes for hazardous rolls. The hazardous check is tested after you fire a hazardous weapon in the shooting phase. Oftentimes this will be psychic powers used by characters that have an upgraded, more powerful version that has the hazardous keyword, making it possible to suffer mortal wounds after using that and failing the hazardous check in exchange for doing more damage. If your character's wounded and could die from that hazardous check, saving a command point reroll to reroll that hazardous check and ensure that you don't take any additional damage from that can be impactful. But again, remember that that will most likely be during the shooting phase, and if you command point reroll that hazardous check, you can't then command point any of your hit rolls, wound rolls, or saving throws for the rest of that phase. Importantly, you can't reroll leadership or battle shock checks with this command reroll, but there is another stratagem that will interact with those that we'll talk about later. The last note I want to throw down about command reroll that I hope doesn't get misplayed in the new edition is that the stratagem doesn't have an actual target. It basically targets the dice roll specifically. So if you have effects that come into play when you target a unit with a stratagem, command reroll will not come into play for them. So for example, if you have rights of battle that allow you to use a stratagem on a unit for no command points, you unfortunately cannot use that effect on command reroll. Moving on, we have counter offensive. This is used in the fight phase. It costs two command points and is used after an enemy unit has fought. The stratagem then allows you to target one unit from your army and fight with that unit next in the phase. This is most useful when your opponent has multiple units that are going in a particular phase back to back. Either they've charged and gained the Always Strikes First effect, and for example, they are all fighting in the Always Strikes First section of the fight phase, whereas your units, if they don't have any Strikes First effects active on them, will fight after those units in the Fight Normally section of the fight phase. This stratagem allows you to fight with one of those units who would not normally be eligible to fight until the next step of the phase, interrupt the sequence of your opponents going with all of their units that would normally fight first. This is incredibly important for receiving charges from multiple enemy units, since if your opponent charges two units into two of your units, they'll get to fight with one first, then you could use the interrupt with to fight with the other unit and attack your opponent before they hit you. One important thing to note as well is that this will interact interestingly with defensive fight first effects, although we don't know how many of those exist in the game, with the new rules that the player receiving the attacks, the player whose turn it is not 
not currently, will choose the order in which units fight in the fight phase, or at least will choose to fight with their unit first, and using counteroffensive in your own turn can potentially upset that. But the player who gets to choose the first fighting unit will still always get to swing before you, since this stratagem only comes into play after an enemy has fought. As a little bit of a caveat to counteroffensive as well, your unit has to currently be eligible to fight in order to be selected. So if they haven't charged that turn and aren't currently in melee, they actually are not eligible to be selected. So if your opponent is clever with their pile in and consolidate moves, they can start the phase out of combat with you and then use their pile to get into combat with you, uh, potentially in order to fight without you being able to interrupt. Epic Challenge is another fight phase stratagem that is used when a character unit from your army is in engagement range of an attached unit. An attached unit is a unit that it has an included character. That unit is often referred to as the bodyguard unit, but the amalgamation of the two is referred to as an attached unit. You select one character model in your own unit, and importantly, that character model itself doesn't have to be in engagement range of the enemy. The unit has to be an engagement range of an enemy attached unit. So if the target of the stratagem is your own attached unit, you can select the character to get the benefit even if they're far away from the fight. The effect of the stratagem is that that character gets the precision weapon ability until the end of that phase. Precision allows successful wounds made by those weapons to be assigned to enemy character models that are within the targeted unit rather than the normal attack sequence. This is where the attack sequence of 40k gets a little bit funky because if you choose to slow roll out your attacks, that is not using the fast dice rolling rules that we discussed in the command reroll section, each of your attacks is resolved sequentially. So you'll be able to roll an attack if it successfully wounds, you can assign it to the target character, and then that character's controlling player will take their save and assign damage if necessary. And if you're trying to kill their character, any subsequent attacks after their character is destroyed can then just be assigned to the unit normally. Assuming that you want to target the character with all of your successful wounds, I think that you'll probably be able to just fast roll this out and tell your opponent to take saves in the character until it's dead. The only situation in which that would matter is if you want to retarget away from the character halfway through your attack sequence, but Generally speaking, I don't think that's gonna be the case. If we're using Epic Duel, we're trying to duel their character to death. It is important to note that this is a choice. You are not forced to deal damage to the character. So if you have weapons with extra attacks, for example, you can use some of them to target the unit if you want a specific profile matchup that's beneficial to you with your additional attacks, and then maybe use your big attacks to target the character specifically. There's a lot of optionality in this one, and ultimately it doesn't really lose efficiency if you're trying to kill their characters. Now, it is important to remember that characters are usually tougher to kill than the unit they're attached with. So you'll most likely not do as much damage as you would just attacking into the unit, but killing a character is usually a pretty big swing in terms of the offense of the unit that you're engaging, since the characters will most likely be the best models in that unit at fighting, and they'll lose any support abilities that they might have been giving them. Another thing to note is that the target of the challenge can be not only a unit with an attached character, but also an independent character. And this can mean things like big monsters or vehicles, like Bellacore or Canis Rex can be targeted with Epic Duel, even if they don't have a unit surrounding them. This can allow your huge monsters and vehicles with enormously powerful melee attacks to smush enemy characters out of units that they wouldn't normally be able to access, which is some of the highest value damage that you can get on your opponent's army. Overall, I think Epic Duel is going to be a pretty transformative stratagem to 40k, and I think uh, I wouldn't get a chance too attached to your characters in this edition. I think that there's a pretty good chance that they get dueled to death by enormous demons and monstrous Primarchs, and... Uh, probably killed once they get to melee. Insane Bravery is the next stratagem. This is used in the command phase, specifically the Battleshock step of your command phase. This is the step in which you'll check Battleshock for each unit that is below half strength. That means either half of their starting number of models or below half of their starting wounds if they are a single model unit. This stratagem comes into play specifically after you have failed a Battleshock test taken for a unit from your army. So it gives you a little bit of information before you elect to use the stratagem. You know whether or not your Battleshock test has succeeded or failed when it comes to the time to be able to use a stratagem. And even though failing a Battleshock test normally Battleshocks you, and Battleshocked units can't be targeted by stratagems, this stratagem does have an exception and allows you to automatically pass that Battleshock test instead of failing it. Importantly, if you have effects that inflict Battleshock on you during the command phase that aren't necessarily the normal Battleshock, it appears that Insane Bravery will still come into play. So we just saw that with Chaos Knights where they can force an additional Battleshock test on you if you are below 
your starting strength, meaning you've suffered one or more wounds or lost one or more models. And it looks like Insane Bravery can also protect you from that. This is vitally important for holding on to objectives. Since objective scoring will happen at the end of the command phase after the Battleshock step resolves. And if you had failed that Battleshock test, you would not be considered to be controlling that objective. So being able to see if your vital units that are holding on to objectives pass or fail their Battleshock test, you can then auto pass if you need to for using this stratagem for one CP in order to retain control of that objective. It is important to note though that it is specifically only Battleshock tests and only during your Battleshock step of your command phase. So if you have other units that are capable of forcing Battleshock on you outside of the command phase, this stratagem will not be usable. And you can't command reroll those leadership tests either. So there's no way to really dice fix them. The grenade stratagem is used in your shooting phase and allows you to chuck a couple grenades at an enemy within eight inches and visible to one of your units with the grenades key. Word. Now the timing of this stratagem is super weird. You can only select grenades units from your army that are not in melee and have not been selected to shoot this phase. However, you don't need to select that unit to shoot to use the stratagem, and in fact you don't even need to be eligible to shoot to use that stratagem. So units that have fallen back or advanced are still eligible to be targeted by grenades. When you use the stratagem, you choose an enemy within 8 inches and visible to the grenade unit that is not in melee, roll 6d6 and for each four plus, the enemy unit suffers one mortal wound. Since a four plus is about a coin flip, you're gonna be inflicting somewhere around three mortal wounds on average for the cost of one CP. Importantly, because you only need visibility and range from your unit to their unit, you only need to see with one model from your unit in order to be able to use the stratagem. And like I said before, that unit doesn't even have to be eligible to attack. The fact that the stratagem is used before your unit attacks but doesn't require them to attack immediately is also interesting because it means that you can't shoot all of your units and then elect to use grenades afterwards. You have to hold the unit with the grenade available until after you've resolved the mortal wounds from the stratagem. But one thing you can do is choose the unit to throw the grenade, then move on and attack with other units then go back and shoot normally with the unit that just threw the grenade, assuming that they're eligible. Well, I'm not sure it makes quite as much difference given the rules in the current edition. You also don't need to be eligible to attack the enemy unit that you target with ranged attacks. They just have to be within eight inches visible to you and not in engagement range. But to be fair, I'm not aware of any effects that would make them untargetable under those circumstances. So while they may have special rules or something that make them unable to be attacked outside a certain distance, your grenades don't care about that. This is most useful towards the end of your shooting phase. If you have enemy models that are wounded and almost dead or enemy units that are just on a couple wounds. That's why the timing of this stratagem is super duper important because you can't shoot your whole army, see how much damage you dealt to your opponent and then use grenades. At least one of the units from your army within eight inches of the target has to not have fired yet. But what you can do is see if you've gotten them low and finish off enemy models or units that were wounded during your shooting phase. Now on a kind of similar note, we can talk about tank shock. This is gonna be one of the most wild stratagems in the new edition because it is insanely powerful. It's used in your charge phase and selects one vehicle from your army. Importantly, this only works if you choose the vehicle from your army before it makes a charge move because it gives them a benefit on their charge move. If you use it after they've charged, it doesn't do anything. Until the end of the phase, after that unit ends a charge move, which is why it's important to target them before you charge, you can select one enemy unit with an engagement range of them, that means one inch horizontally or five inches vertically, and select one melee weapon your unit is equipped with. You roll a number of d6 equal to that weapon's strength characteristic, adding two if the strength is higher than your opponent's toughness. For each five plus on that roll, the enemy unit suffers one mortal wound up to a maximum of six. Now for most tanks, you'll have strength six to strength eight, of just normal melee weapons. And this is gonna be inflicting between three and four mortal wounds on a good roll, which is pretty solid for one command point. Where the stratagem gets absolutely bizarre are units that are incredibly good at melee already. So dreadnoughts or knights walkers, for example, are all gonna be eligible to use this stratagem based on the current wording and will all have high strength weapons. Knights, for example, can have their big power fists that are upwards of strength 20. And since strength 20 will be higher than any toughness value in the game, they're automatically gonna be rolling 22 dice, which gives them an almost certainty that they will inflict the maximum amount of mortal wounds. So if you have vehicles that already have good melee weapons, this stratagem is gonna do immense amounts of damage to enemies. 
enemies, and especially high resilience enemies like heavy infantry, things like terminators, that vehicles aren't necessarily going to be great at killing because while they have high damage, they'll have a low volume of attacks. Tank shock will give you the opportunity to kill an extra two or so of them for only one CP, which is a great investment. You can also select units that you don't even intend to attack. For example, you can charge into two enemy units and tank shock one of them to try to kill them or reduce the amount of incoming damage from them and then make your attacks on a different enemy unit. There are even situations where you can use this to clear out an enemy unit that you're base to base with to then allow you to pile in and consult consolidate in new directions, freeing you up for your combat movement. Because you've ended the charge move in engagement range of the target, your unit has also been considered to have made a successful charge. So even if you tank shock the unit that you are engaging with and kill it, your unit can still pile in and consolidate, assuming it can fulfill all of the requirements to be able to perform and finish a pile in and consolidation move. A caveat here is that I wouldn't be too surprised to see this stratagem get eroded to not work on walkers, since walker vehicles typically have incredibly powerful powerful melee weapons, and that's a lot of the situations where this stratagem gets really, really silly. If it doesn't, then it's going to be great for things like Dreadnoughts and Knights, like I said before, but if it does, it'll be useful to buff the melee output of a lot of your non- melee specific vehicles. Rapid Ingress is a 1 CP movement phase stratagem used at the end of your opponent's movement phase. This is specifically after they've completed their reinforcement step. So all of their reinforcements have entered from deep strike or strategic reserve onto the table. Target one unit from your army that is currently in reserves and it can immediately arrive on the battlefield as if it were your reinforcement step rather than the end of your opponent's movement phase. The only restriction is that you can't use a stratagem to arrive on the battlefield during a battle round, it would not normally be able to do so. So strategic reserve units, for example, that can't arrive in the first battle round will not be eligible on turn one to be rapid ingressed in. But unless we see some additional rules regarding deep strikes, units in deep strike, for example, teleporting terminators, will be able to. Because this is used at the end of your opponent's movement phase, you get to see exactly where you, they've moved their models and where they can draw a line of sight or make easy charges to. Meaning that you can bring in your reserves in an aggressive position that they don't have access to. Because at the end of your opponent's turn, then it comes back to your turn, you'll immediately get a movement phase and that unit will be able to move and activate normally, which is the big benefit of this stratagem. Normally units that are arriving from reserve can't make normal moves. They can only shoot and charge and use their abilities. So having that unit teleport or reserve onto the table early allows them to use or be benefited by your command phase abilities and also move and get a closer charge that they nor normally wouldn't be able to. You do have to keep in mind though that your opponent will get a turn to counter this because they're still going to go through their shooting, charge, and fight phases. You have to have a good position to place that unit defensively or have a very good plan about what you're going to do when your opponent inevitably attacks them. This stratagem is going to be incredibly effective at mucking up the game plan of enemies, and it's going to require a lot of careful play if your opponent has a lot of strategic reserves or deep strikers that can really mess up your game plan if they show up at inopportune times. Now, the next stratagem we're going to talk about is Fire Overwatch, and I'm going to add a little bit of a caveat here and make a bit of an assumption. A a piece of timing that's been important in 8th and 9th edition is that stratagems that allow you to operate out of phase aren't usually affected by things that allow you to act as if it were a different phase. So for example, if a unit moves as if it were the movement phase, but it's your shooting phase, then that would not trigger things like the fire overwatch stratagem. I'm going to move forward assuming that this is still the case. It doesn't say so in the stratagem portion specifically, but that would be in probably an intro section to the rulebook that talks about effect timing. That's a page that we don't necessarily have yet though, so we can't really prognosticate too much. Fire Overwatch is an incredibly powerful effect and an important one in this new edition because of how it's been changed from previous editions. It's used in your opponent's move or charge phase after an enemy unit is set up on the battlefield, so comes out of strategic reserve or deep strike, or potentially disembarks a transport, although that one we're not 100% sure on, or when they start or end a move, advance, fall back, or charge move. Importantly, this isn't just when they begin or end their movement activation, so when they're chosen to move, because they can be chosen to remain stationary, which does not trigger fire overwatch. If you stay still, enemies don't shoot you. You target one unit from your army within 24 of them that is eligible to shoot. So for example, is not in engagement range and you can shoot at that enemy as if it were your shooting phase. This follows the normal restriction. So they have to be in range and line of sight of the target and the target can't have any effects that prevent them from being targeted targeted like the lone operative ability. The only restriction is that you don't use the unit's shooting's ballistic skill and you ignore any modifiers to it. You only hit on sixes, 
full stop. Modifiers are specifically numerical modifiers, so plus one to hit, minus one to hit, for example. So things like rerolls will still come into play, or effects like torrent weapons that automatically hit. You can only use the stratagem once per phase as well, so you can't use it immediately after your opponent moves, and then also before they charge to shoot them multiple times. But because it can be used before a unit moves, you can run a unit, for example, with torrent weapons up to the enemy unit, shoot them in your own shooting phase, and then when it comes to their movement phase before they declare a movement, if they don't remain stationary, you can use the stratagem to shoot them again. If you have weapons that automatically hit or full reroll to hit, the Overwatch effects are always super powerful. And being a 24 inch range allows you to use those weapons if they have a range up to 24 inches from a longer distance than they've ever been used before. If you're used to previous editions of Overwatch, this works pretty fundamentally differently because it doesn't require you to be targeted in any way by the opposing player. In previous editions, you could fire Overwatch if you were targeted as a charge. Now you just have to be in line of sight and within 24 inches, meaning that even if your opponent declares a charge, you can use the stratagem on something not even remotely in engaged in that charge in order to shoot them before they make their charge move. This stratagem is going to be massively impactful in the new edition of the game and I think makes torrent weapons, automatically hitting weapons or weapons that are very consistent that have good rerolls, for example, incredibly powerful. Next, we get to some defensive stratagems and you notice some consistent wording on these ones. They're used specifically after an attacking enemy unit in their shooting phase has selected targets and the target of the stratagem is one of the units that they selected as a target. These are very consistent for defensive stratagems stratagems in the game, so you'll probably see this come up a lot. The first one is go to ground. You can use it on a targeted infantry unit during your opponent's shooting phase that has been targeted by an enemy unit's attacks. It gives them the benefit of cover, so plus one to their saving throw, up to a three plus if the opponent has an AP zero weapon, and a six plus invulnerable save. As long as the attacking unit doesn't have the ignore cover ability, this is gonna give you a big bump to your defensive characteristics. However, it's important to note that getting the benefit of cover doesn't stack with already having cover. If you have other things buffing your save as well, it's important to remember that your save can only be modified by plus one after your opponent's armor penetration characteristic has been calculated in. So if you are a four plus save, have cover and a plus one to your save from some sort of other effect. If your opponent's AP zero, you're only going to get one of those two bonuses, not both. Another important thing to note about these defensive effects as well is that they come into play until the end of the phase, so they'll benefit you against the attacks made by the unit that you just targeted you, but then if your opponent targets you with any subsequent units, you're still gonna get those benefits. It's not just useful for a single attack. And it can disincentivize your opponent from attacking you with multiple things, forcing them to spread their damage around your army. An extremely similar stratagem is Smokescreen. This is used on units with the smoke keyword, which is normally tanks and vehicles or units with smoke bombs. It has exactly the same targeting and timing as the go to ground, but gives you stealth instead of the six plus invulnerable save in addition to the benefit of cover. Stealth is minus one to be hit with ranged attacks, which is basically the effect of the previous edition smokescreen, but now getting the benefit of cover, it will also improve your armor save. This is gonna make units like land raiders that have really strong armor saves already, pretty resilient against high AP enemy shooting. Even anti-tank weapons at AP three or AP four are only gonna be forcing them on a four or five plus save, which is eminently passable. In addition to suffering that minus one to hit from stealth as well, it makes your hardy vehicles super tough to kill. Now the last strategy we have to talk about, and certainly not the least one, is another one that has seen a huge transformation from its effect in ninth edition. This is the heroic intervention stratagem and is usable at the the end of your opponent's charge phase for two CP if a unit from your army is within six inches of an enemy unit that made a charge move that turn. The target unit has to be eligible to declare a charge against that enemy, meaning that you can't be in engagement range, for example, and the effect is that you immediately charge them. Because you're within six inches, unless there's intervening models or terrain, you'll most likely need to roll a five inch charge because that would get you five inches plus the engagement range of your unit. It's important to keep in mind that you can move through friendly models as long as they you, you and the other model are not both monsters or vehicles. So even if you have units that are engaged in a melee, you can get in there and interact. This does have a restriction that you can't use it on vehicle units unless they are walkers. So there's no tanks heroically charging into melee and you don't receive the charge bonus this turn. This means that you don't automatically strike first, so you don't get to interrupt the normal flow of combat, but it does get you into melee with your opponent. And if you can get to base to base with them, unless they kill you, then you're gonna be eligible to fight 
during the fight normal step of the phase. The other benefit of moving during your opponent's charge phase is you can really mess with their ability to fight your units. Because models have to make pile-in and consolidate moves to get base to base with enemy models, this can force the target unit to make pile-ins in awkward ways where they can't quite engage their initial target as easily as they wanted to. It is important to note, however, that the restriction of charging units that they can only target units that they charge with their attacks is no longer the case like it was in previous editions. So your unit performing this counter charge heroic intervention into melee is perfectly eligible to be attacked. So your opponent can just swing away at them, and if they're relatively light, unless you have a fight first effect on yourself, they'll be able to swing first and just fight you and kill you. This is really a stratagem that's more useful the tighter the combats are and the more adept you are at making fight phase and combat phase movements, since being able to muck up with your opponent's movements is a huge deal. But also getting into melee with units that are powerful and resilient in their own right to get fight activations during your opponent turn and potentially make big swings in the fight phase is also super impactful. And you can use those units to defend your other squishier units. So with that, that is all of the stratagems in the Warhammer 40k 10th edition rulebook. Let me know down in the comments section what the one you expect to use the most is. And big thanks for watching all the way to the end of the video. Thanks as well to everyone who supports the channel, either over on Patreon at patreon.com slash tactical tortoise, YouTube channel members, Twitch subscribers, all you people are great and I love you. Remember to keep it classy folks and have happy wargaming.